to the floor. And maybe, David, what I might just ask you, collaboration, integration, exchange of information seem to repeat throughout your presentation this morning. In the UK, um, who's driving BIM? Um, is it clients? Is it um, contractors? Where along the supply chain? Who are the, the, the key drivers, motivators of it? I think there's a big push coming from, if you like, from supply chain in terms of designers and contractors. You can imagine in the UK, the government programme has just started. You know, we've mentioned the first trial project isn't inside. So you've got to actually say that, you know, the, at this moment in time, it's not the pull, it's actually the push. So it's very much, if you like, coming supply chain from designers that want to be more efficient and contractors that want to win more work by being able to reduce you know, the, the amount of their, their tender costs through BIM. So it's very much in the UK at this moment in time coming from supply chain. Okay. And just, you mentioned um, pilot projects. Could you just flesh that out a little bit for us? Um, yeah, as we mentioned, we're working with each government department in turn. The first one's the Ministry of Justice, nice and easy because, you know, their product is quite repetitive in terms of, you know, prison cell blocks. We've worked with them, you saw the process map, we've been right through their whole process now, looked to, to try and build a BIM strategy with them. And off the back of that, we've now got the first uh, four pilot projects identified, ready to hit site. We've built the BIM models for them. We're now getting ready to start, you know, trying to see how we drive efficiency on them. What we are going to do is put them under the microscope as well to say, you know, where did it go right, where did it go wrong, trying to look in terms of that continuous improvement side as well. And are we getting efficiencies as we set out in our hypothesis at the beginning of the, of the value proposition for BIM? And those projects are at the very early stages, no ground is broken on those? The ground is broken in June. Is it right? June this year, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, can I open up the floor? Any questions? Sorry, over here. I, I think that's a great question, and I think I'm sure the vendors would be. Sorry, can't hear the question. Would you? Okay. Sorry, Claire, could you just repeat that question? Sorry, Sorry I'll repeat the question. Um, I just, through David's presentation, he spoke of four components, I suppose, of this process one being the client, one being technology, one being the design team or supply chain, and also one being the end users and the people using the data. So I just wonder where the biggest challenge is, or where you see the biggest challenge, which part of that component. I'll, I'll probably answer it. I think if you went back a couple of years ago, I'd say the technology is one of the biggest barriers. I'm sure many designers would think if you use some of the product suites around about BIM, in terms of usability, it was almost unusable, especially in services world. And I think it's only in the last couple of years that the technology barrier has gone away, if you like. Mm -hmm. They're accessible in terms of using the, the, there's no You can get efficiency from using it. I think some of the services tools a couple of years back, you're going back the way. So that's kind of gone down, if you like. The technology aspect is a barrier has gone down. Where we are in the UK, we're still seeing it very much about behavioural change now. That definitely for us is the big part to crack. But you still need to have the technology in there as a solid foundation. You know, that's inconvenient truth that, you know, the technology is very much part of it. But it's a great question. You know, the first thing, you could be doing a lot of the BIM programme today without the technology. You go back, start thinking about how do you become more collaborative, how do you become more lean, then how do you underpin it with a digital tool set? So, yeah, number one is definitely behavioural, changing that heuristic bias of industry. Yeah, so everybody really needs to move together and it needs to move forward as one, really. It, it, it does completely, you know, it, and it's, that's the hard part, is trying to codify it and bring it all together, if you like, into a programme. Uh, you know, it's quite easy to go out and tell people to go and do something, but it's hard to change people to change their behaviours. And I think what we're seeing is people coming into the industry from, if you like, out, out of universities at the moment, just by their very nature, you know, how they integrate with technology, they are much more collaborative. It's training the people that have been in the industry for 20, 30 years to do it different. That's a real challenge. So just here, John. Um, David, uh, excellent uh, lecture this morning, or discussion. But my question for you is, um, what have you found has been the biggest uh, asset in increasing awareness about BIM in the UK? I think many of you have probably met Paul Morell, the Chief Construction Advisor. 
having, if you like, you know, a, a leader for change. You know, somebody. It's, and Paul will tell you he's not a BIM expert, but having somebody at high profile within, you know, our government that wants to try and drive change has been quite fundamental. You know, having some real thought leadership, because suddenly people, you know, have came up and they've listened to, to somebody that wants to drive. So, driving change top down has definitely been good, you know, for industry. Uh, so I think that's probably been number one. I think number two, there's a real desire in the UK at the moment for change as well. People are starting to see what the cost of not doing it is as well. You know that, well, by 2016, if we're not ready to export our skills, there'll be others coming in from other nations that, that can. So I think it's, you know, both. But I think having a person at the top has certainly helped change the intelligent client, if you like. Hold on a uh, Trevor Woods from Construct IT. The, the, the threshold for BIM projects in the UK is set at 5 million. Up until about 12 months ago, that was at 50 million. What was the, the big driver in, in, in reducing it down to, to 5 million? And just as an observation, the threshold in the Netherlands is, is 10 million, but in Denmark it's 677,000 euros. How they come up with that figure, I'm not sure, but do you see the 5 million figure dropping? in the UK as well. Uh, well, in fact, uh, when we published the Government Construction Strategy, you're right, it went from 50 to 5 to actually in the Government Construction Strategy, we dropped the threshold completely. And we've got to the point of saying we can't see any project that we don't see any value proposition in BIM. And I feel like, you know, what we want to do is stress test it. Like I said, you know, the first question, are we going to get value from doing this in BIM? That's the first question, rather, as you rightly say, you know, the 5 million. And if you take a typical project in the UK, it's probably below the 5 million. So we've got to make sure that happens. So, yeah. The reason when we actually looked through it is we felt that the cost of implementing BIM was, you know, so insignificant now that, you know, there wasn't, in terms of scalability, any project could find that uh, it wasn't relevant or it didn't have a successful return on investment. I think there's a couple of them, Matt. Yes, it, it will indeed. It extends, if you like, to government departments, such as the Highways Agency. So if you like, these linear programmes uh, that they do will be covered. So infrastructure are very much part of it by the government departments, if you like. But we're also working, if you like, with a series of, you know, how do you put it, non-central departments as well. Transport for London, we're working alongside them. So we think that, you know, the civil world is very much part of, of our programme as well. Okay, far corner, the back. Oh yeah, Derek Owens here from City. Just a quick query regarding the policy um, and uh, how you, um, that influences how projects are tendered, particularly in the public sector. So, uh, you know, to build in this requirement, and you're saying it should be an output-based requirement, not a specified requirement where people will just do it for told. Um, how has the public procurement process been adjusted to accommodate that requirement? Because at the moment here, it's, it's, it's cost and quality in a particular ratio. Uh, the tenders tend to come back very low in cost, and you know, it, in terms of better outcomes for buildings. How, how did you handle that challenge in the UK? I think we need to concentrate on that aspect a lot here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. I, I would say it's one we've not cracked yet. You know, it, BIM with the, the MOJ is the first time it's actually featured in the tender. You know, it's part of the quality submission side of it in terms of how you're going to manage data, what have you done from BIM, and by the way, this is what we want from you. We're now looking, it actually falls under a, a legal package. We've got, a, you know, we've got legal contract insurance, so that team at the moment is trying to look at how it sits within the PQQ question set. So I've got to admit, great question, it's one we haven't fully resolved yet, but come this year it will be part of the, the outputs from what we achieve. And again, it comes back to intelligent clients that don't procure purely on commodity as well, so completely agree, it's one we've got to get right with the tender process. i just take one more question just before we move on. Just here. Sorry, but if you ultimately go with the implementation <coughs> of the whole process, is the government going to get involved in the question over the technical issues of data conversion and file formats, or um, are you going to leave that up to market forces? The, the reality is in terms of, if you like, what we call it level three integration or your integrated project delivery, we are going to start to, we're giving it, at this moment in time, very little thought, if I'm truly honest. We will probably next year start thinking about level three, and the big part of it is going to be scoping, because it's such a big thing for us. 
what do we have to do to get ready to even start thinking about level three? It's that in itself for us is a work package. So I don't know the answer to that one as yet at the moment. But uh, you're right. It is the way to go. Uh, there's a, there's a Boston-based contractor. Some of you might have heard called John Toshi. Uh, you know, John's about 100 million pound. We went across to spend a bit of time with John last year, and he is doing, if you like, integrated project delivery at this moment. And you think that as an industry is where we've got to be working together with the client and the supply chain in a completely integrated manner. But it needs the complete intelligent team together round about it and the very best technology. But, uh, I suppose what I was aiming at was that there is a tendency towards favouring a particular path regarding software within the industry and if that is counterbalanced um, it's going to force a lot of people in a direction that the government might want to go in either because that will lead the stream towards yeah. one particular provider and um, I think if that isn't um, addressed in the beginning then some people might have gone down the path too far to actually change in the end and it is, it's going to become a bigger issue than it is now. The UK view is you know, we will not dictate software platforms at all you know, so we leave that up that complexity side to the supply chain to pick what we're asking for at the moment, if you like, is we mentioned our Kobe data set. We're asking for the files in the, you know, in the raw native format, whatever that may be, along with a 2D PDF. That, that, that's our, you know, our, at the moment. But we certainly do not intend to start mandating any of the software plan. We want to stay agnostic. It's not a software issue. It's an integration <coughs> issue between the softwares and the file format issue. But like, I suppose that isn't a question for this forum. But if there isn't a, a, a communal pat platform that all the softwares can work from, yes, and then total integration will not be possible. You're, you're right. And what, what we're doing is we're working, I don't know if you remember the push groups that we had. The number one we had up there was a software technology alliance where we got everybody into one room to have a well-informed and joined up conversation. Just to, just to help influence and shape, you know, we, we can't go and tell them what to do, but we can hopefully nudge them and give them a bit of vision as per the question you've said, how do we answer these questions? And I must admit, you know, we, we do hope that we'll listen to what we want as well. We've also asked for a Kobe button. We press this button, all the Kobe comes out. So we'll see what happens. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think what we need to do now is we move on to the next phase of uh, our seminar.